Hello and welcome back to the Lambda Cube Unboxed. In this video, we're going to introduce types into the Lambda Calculus. The result of this is what's known as the Simply Type Lambda Calculus, which is denoted by a lambda with a simple arrow. Before we start with the definition of that, let's quickly recall the conclusion at the end of the first chapter. Types are desirable when it comes to functions. Functions that don't expect a specific type of object and don't tell us what objects they will return are often too general. Although addition might make sense for numbers and strings alike, it's not clear what the factorial or square root of a string is supposed to be. This is the case for almost all mathematical functions which are mappings from a specific domain to a codomain. Usually this codomain, the set of elements a function maps to, is very dependent on the domain and the behavior of the function. Even more so if we talk about programming, where it's important that we get an element with specific properties as an input. So we want to be able to restrict the input of a function and also be able to specify what kind of objects the function is going to return. In order to do so, we introduce simple types. Each term of the lambda calculus will get a type which contains the information on its required input type and what type the output will have. We begin once again with a rather informal motivation before we look at the formal definition. Consider the function f of x equals x squared plus 1. We can translate this function into the lambda calculus and write lambda x dot add applied to multiply xx, which is the x squared, applied to 1. Now, this function should take natural numbers and map them to natural numbers. We denote this by putting a colon behind the term and we write down natural numbers to natural numbers. And to say that the input should actually be of type n, we write lambda x of type n instead of just lambda x. So variables can have types and terms can have types too. For the lambda calculus, the set of simple types is constructed as follows. As with lambda terms, we have a finite set of variables v and each type variable is a type by itself, a variable type. We can also combine two types with an arrow to get an arrow type. These types are called simple since we can only do one thing, attach another type. We can have a single type variable as a type or create a long chain of arrow types, nothing else. We're going to use small Greek letters like alpha, beta, gamma, and variants of these for type variables, and sigma, tau, and rho for any types. So sigma, tau, and rho can stand for a variable type, but also any kind of arrow type. Again, we're going to denote syntactical identity by the equivalent sign, and we can leave out the outermost parentheses. Arrow types, just like abstractions in lambda terms, are right associative, so we can also leave out the corresponding parentheses. With these types at hand, we can now define the set of simply typed lambda terms. The definition should look quite familiar to you, as it only really differs in one detail from the definition of untyped lambda terms. Whenever we construct an abstraction, we need not only the variable which we want to abstract, but also a type for this variable. An abstraction now has the form lambda x of type sigma dot m. Translating the identity function from the untyped into the simply typed lambda calculus is quite simple. We need to choose a type for the input variable, let's say alpha, and then we would write the terms as follows. Lambda x of type alpha dot x. This term has something of type alpha as an input and it outputs it again, so it returns something of type alpha. The type of the term is therefore alpha to alpha. If we now apply something of type alpha, maybe a variable y, we get the term lambda x of type alpha dot x apply to y. This term would then have the type of the outcome, so it's of type alpha. But what if we don't apply a term of type alpha but any other type to this identity function? This would actually be valid by the current definition of terms. There's no restrictions of any sort in the application or abstraction rule. Additionally, by our definition, we could also construct a term where we take a variable x of type alpha and a variable y of type beta, and we apply them to one another. So, lambda x of type alpha, lambda y of type beta, dot x apply to y. What type would this lambda term have? There's actually quite a lot of constructions that are allowed by definition, but contradict intuition and the rules that we define later. This is why the definition that we stated actually doesn't define the set of simply typed lambda terms, but rather only the set of pre-typed lambda terms. So a set that has the simply typed lambda terms as a proper subset 
but also contains some terms that look like simply typed lambda terms, but aren't actually typable like that. Properly typable lambda terms will be called legal terms. We're going to come to that definition very soon, and we're going to introduce rules to check whether a pre-typed term is legal. Before we do that, let's take a look at our last example. Lambda x of type alpha dot y apply to x. Here we have a free variable whose type is unknown. This term takes an element of type alpha, and then we don't really know what the type of y applied to x is, as we don't know the type of y. We can guess and just give the result of y applied to x any type sigma. So the whole term would have the type alpha to sigma. So we've decided y applied to x has type sigma, and we know x has type alpha. Since y applied to x is an abstraction and x is of type alpha, y would need to be an abstraction with an input of type alpha returning something of type sigma. So y would need to be an abstraction of type alpha to sigma. These conclusions that we just came to can be done for any pre-type term to validate or check that the types fit and what type the free variables need to have. This process is called derivation and might be familiar to you from courses like logic or any kind of mathematical theory. Derivation, also called deduction, is the process of forming new information from already gained knowledge. For this, transformation rules are applied to premises to get to further conclusions. So we start with one or more propositions that are assumed to be true, or are true by definition, called axioms. And by continuously applying inference rules, we can prove other propositions. A transformation or inference rule is written like so. We have a finite number of premises, p1, p2, up to pn, that we write next to each other. We draw a long line, and underneath that, the conclusion. Such a rule is to be read top-down, and it says, if the propositions on top are true, we can conclude the proposition at the bottom. An example of quite a common inference rule that we use in our daily life is called the modus ponens of propositional logic. It has two premises. One is the implication if A then B, and the other is just A. The conclusion is B. Modus ponens says if A holds and from A follows B, then the conclusion is B holds. As mentioned, a derivation is a sequence of applying inference rules starting from some axioms. But normally, we don't start with ground truths, but with a conclusion, and we want to find the derivation that proves this proposition. So we don't want to start from the top, but rather from the bottom. So we write whatever we want to prove at the bottom, and then we go backwards, hopefully reaching axioms at the top. To be able to formulate premises, propositions, and conclusions, we need to introduce a few definitions. Whenever we want to state that a term m has type sigma, we can do so in a statement where we put the term which is called a subject before a colon and the type behind it. If the term is if the term is only a variable, such a statement is called a declaration. A context gamma is a set of declarations for pairwise different variables. So we take a set of variables, give each of them a type, and then we put them together. With such a context, we're going to set the types of free variables. This context will represent what we assume to be true in our system. So we could, for example, say that natural numbers will all have the same type. With these constructs, we can form a judgment which will be the way to formulate propositions, premises, and conclusions. A judgment reads as gamma yields m of type sigma, and it tells us if we have the context gamma and free variables typed accordingly, then m has the type sigma. Now, if a term m can be found in a judgment, so if there's a context gamma and a type sigma so that m has type sigma under context gamma, we call such a term legal. Remember that up until now, we only defined pre-type terms. The set of simply typed lambda terms are exactly the legal pre-type terms. The set of the simply typed lambda terms are exactly the legal pre-type terms. We'll also call these typable. In our examples from before, we already constructed a few judgments. We stated that the identity function over an input of type alpha has type alpha to alpha. And since we don't have any free variables, the context is empty. This is a legal term. The other two examples were not quite so simple. First, we applied a term y to the identity function, and we required it to be of type alpha. So y of type alpha has to be in the context for this to work. In the last example, we concluded that if we have the term lambda x of type alpha dot y apply to x, it could have the type alpha to sigma. And this only holds if y is of type alpha to sigma. 
Again, we have to assume a type for y, and we need to put it into the context. If we chose the context to be empty, this judgment wouldn't be derivable. So, in conclusion, whenever we want to state that a term has a certain type in a certain setting, we will form a judgment. The inference rules that are allowed are given by the deduction system. In the simply typed lambda calculus, we have only three derivation rules, one for each step of the inductive term definition. The variable rule says, if we have a declaration in the context gamma, like term variable x has type sigma, then gamma yields x has type sigma. To put it simply, if x has type sigma, then x has type sigma. These are going to be our axioms. The second rule, called application rule, has two premises. If gamma yields that m is of type sigma to tau, so m is an abstraction of some sort, and gamma also yields that n is of type sigma, then gamma yields that m applied to n is of type tau. Be aware that we always use the same context, and that n has the type sigma, which is the input type of m. This is quite intuitive, and it resembles the modus ponens. If you want to know more about the correspondence of the lambda calculus and logic, please refer to chapter 7. Lastly, the abstraction rule says that if we have a context containing some declarations in gamma, and the declaration x is of type sigma, and this context yields that m is of type tau, then we can derive that gamma also yields that the abstraction lambda x of type sigma dot m is of type sigma to tau. So, to unpack that a little, whenever we have a term m of an arbitrary type, and in our context we have that x is also of an arbitrary type, then we can abstract x from m, and we're going to get an abstraction of the corresponding type. You may have noticed that these derivation rules look a lot like the formation rules that we have for lambda terms. If we have a variable, it's a legal lambda term. For two lambda terms m and n, we can form a new legal lambda term by applying m to n if their types match accordingly. And lastly, if we have a variable x and a legal term m, we can form an abstraction with its type depending on the type of x and m. If you think about it, this makes quite a bit of sense, as those rules should enable us to derive all simply typed lambda terms. So, although these rules might look a bit complicated at first, the idea behind them is quite simple. Applying them does need some practice, especially since we have to go bottom up. So, the last task will be to look at four examples together with increasing complexity to get used to the notion. Example number one is the identity function. We guessed that without any further assumption in an empty context, lambda x of type alpha dot x has the type alpha to alpha. So we want to prove this given judgment. The term obviously consists of an abstraction, so we need to apply the abstraction rule. The types sigma and tau from the rule are in our case both alpha. So we need to take gamma, which was empty, and add the declaration of x of type alpha. This yields the term m which in our case was just x of type alpha. So next, we try to derive the judgment that x of type alpha yields x of type alpha. Since all that's left is a declaration on the right side of the judgment, we have to apply the variable rule, which is indeed possible. So we've reached our axiom and finished the derivation. So lambda x of type alpha dot x is indeed a legal term. From now on, we're going to omit the variable rule if it's clear that we've reached an axiom. This is always the case when we have only a declaration on the right side, which is contained in the context on the left. The second term that we want to prove legal is lambda x of type alpha dot y applied to x. We assumed this would have the type alpha to some sigma. For now, let's say the context is empty. Once again, we have an abstraction. So we have to take x of type alpha into our context and y applied to x then needs to have the type sigma. This time we need to apply the application rule. y is the term m, x is the term n, and sigma is the type tau. The context is x of type alpha. In the application rule bottom to top, it looks as if we gain a new type sigma. And now the question is, what is this type? In the rule, there's no restrictions on sigma, apart from it being the type of n obtainable from the context gamma. So we're going to use a placeholder type for now. Whenever we reach a point where we need a specific type or we see any other restrictions, we're just going to adjust this placeholder. The two premises we get are therefore context x of type alpha yields x of type tau and context x of type alpha yields y of type tau to sigma. 
Don't get confused that the roles of Sigma and Tau in our examples are switched. This is going to happen quite often, as we use Sigma and Tau frequently for arbitrary types. The placeholder type in our example is Tau. Here we can see that the second premise can only be true if Tau is alpha. Otherwise we can't apply any more rules and we're stuck on a judgement which is not an axiom. So we replace Tau by alpha. Now we can see that in the first premise we're stuck too. This is the case because we haven't specified the type of the free variable y. We already saw this problem earlier when making informal derivations after introducing all definitions. This derivation doesn't work. But if we change the context we started with from empty to y of type alpha to sigma, and also change the derivation accordingly, we can derive the judgment. Both premises at the top are axioms and so they're also true. The third example looks a bit more complex. It's meant to show you that the derivation process is basically always the same, just following the derivation rules. And it also shows that the type of a specific lambda term can almost always be read from the term itself. From an empty context, we want to derive that lambda y of type alpha to beta, lambda z of type alpha dot y applied to z, is of type alpha to beta to alpha to beta. This type should be read as the term first has a term of type alpha to beta as an input, and it returns of type alpha to beta. So the output still has an input of alpha on its own, and the type of the final output is beta. Obviously, we have an abstraction, and we have to apply the abstraction rule. y of type alpha to beta is added to the context and cut from the declaration. Again an abstraction, which leaves the judgment y of type alpha to beta, and z of type alpha yields y applied to z of type beta. Lastly, an application. So we get two premises. The first says that the term y should map the type of z to the type beta. And the second says that z should be of some type matching y. We see again the placeholder type sigma, which in the case of the second premise needs to be alpha, otherwise we'd get stuck. But as we can see, this all works out. We get two axioms since the declaration on the right side also appears in the context. As the last example, we want to look at a derivation that doesn't work. It's one that we mentioned briefly already, and it's quite similar to the third derivation. From the empty context, we want to derive lambda x of type alpha, lambda y of type beta dot xy is of some type. Now, we know already that we need an arrow type for an abstraction, so let's put sigma to tau. Since x is of type alpha, we know sigma has to be alpha, so we change that. Now we can apply the abstraction rule. Here, lambda y of type beta dot xy is again an abstraction with input beta, so tau has to be some type beta to rho. And we can apply the abstraction rule again. We've reached an application once again, so we have to apply the application rule and we get these two premises. We can see that sigma has to be beta for the second premise to be true. But the first premise can't really be saved. x needs to be of type beta to rho for some type rho, but it's of type alpha. This doesn't work, so this term is therefore not legal. That's going to do it for this video. We covered the definition of types and pre-type terms, and we also got to know derivations which are crucial in deciding which terms are actually simply typed and which are not. In the second video of the simply typed lambda calculus, we're going to look at some interesting properties of this system. Thank you very much for watching, and see you then.